I wanted to address the subject of adoption today because it also fits so well into the broader subject of to whom do we belong and where do we belong and so this is not only a subject that obviously directly affects adopted children but it is a general subject for for everyone particularly those people who are the children of immigrants migrants and those people who live in the new world and so there are many of us who come from families whose grandparents or parents come from different countries different cultures different ethnicities even who live on the opposite side of the globe now and this is particularly true in in countries such as the united states um, australia new zealand canada argentina or the countries in south america and also where there are mixed race people with this deeper question of to whom do I belong. If we look at ourselves as being islands of consciousness, then this very notion that if a child is too young to remember something, then it makes no difference, becomes permissible or even allowable, even a recommended viewpoint to have. That's very much a viewpoint that was taken in previous generations and is still very much alive today. This notion that if a child does not remember, therefore it cannot have done them any harm, therefore it can't hurt them. But I personally have worked with many clients who have been adopted. I also have a dear friend who is adopted and I know from this personal experience that there are much, much deeper questions of to whom do I belong? Where do I come from? And the even deeper question of why didn't they love me enough to keep me? What was wrong with me? And so this is often the deeper question that those who have been adopted ask themselves. What was wrong with me? There are other adoptees that I have known and worked with who have lived from a space of my adopted mother is my mother, the other one does, doesn't exist. Simply does not exist. And so there's like a whole part of themselves that is, that is missing. The important thing here is to look at why is the adoption taking place? And so there is the child's perspective. There is the perspective of the adoptive parents so the non-biological parents who wish to adopt the child. Then there is the perspective of the biological parents, the mother, the father, and in many, many cases, if not the majority of cases, also the grandparents. One has to ask, where was the rest of the family? Where were they? And so when we look at adoption as, as a broader subject, there are so many players, so many individuals, and yet the most important individual is often forgotten, and that's the child. And so the deeper question is always, why am I adopting? Am I adopting this child for the child's reasons or for my reasons? In this video, I'm not mm, making a case either for or against adoption. There's no point in doing that. It's a bit like um, talking about for or against poverty. There are lots of solutions to resolve poverty, but as far as we know, we have had poor people ever since the, the, the dawning of time, and we still have it even within developed nations. And so adoption is something that exists and will always exist. Tragedy is part of human life. And so adoption can take place when parents befall a, a tragic accident and they die, they get killed. It can be as a result of war. It can be as a result of a car accident when somebody is orphaned that way and then adopted by another. And so there are many, many reasons for adoption. So it's not as if adoption is ever going to go away. So in order to uh, proclaim something that it's either good or bad would be rather foolhardy. It is neither good nor bad. It is so. It is done, and it is an excellent solution. It is an excellent solution. What would we rather do? See a child placed in an orphanage, which is no place for a child.
in an institution. Um, and so we must look at why is a child adopted? And the reasons are very varied. There are particular pressures that are put on a child if the child is adopted in order to replace a child that once lived. For example, I've had clients who were adopted by a couple whose first baby died, was stillborn, or they had a number of stillborn babies or babies that died at a very young age and finally adopted. And so the child is brought in to fill this deep hole of grief. They are brought in to live in place of that which could not live. And that is a very, very heavy burden. Of course, I'm now stating an extreme there so that those of you who are listening can instantly understand that as well. Yeah, that, that, that would be a problem. But I've worked with individuals where that is true. Or perhaps a mother who's had multiple miscarriages. They don't have to be stillbirths. Multiple miscarriages. And so there is an impulse for the couple to have children, to fulfill the needs of the relationship, to bring a child, to, to create a family, to bring a child into, into life and to create a family. And so when it becomes apparent after maybe three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or more miscarriages. That in itself carries a weight. There is a weight of grief because the first pregnancy of, of a heterosexual couple, it is where paradise promises to be born. So there we have the coming of the, of the Holy Trinity of mother, father, and child. And when that child is lost through miscarriage, something is lost in the relationship. And so when that happens multiple times, then the adopted child comes in to exist, to fill that gap, to become that which we could not have, to fulfill the dream that we could not create. And so the adopted child is living with, why did they not love me enough to keep me? Why could not somebody speak up for me? Why couldn't an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or some cousin somewhere come and get me? Why was there, what was wrong with me? Why was there so much insufficiency that I had to be given away to complete strangers? So not only do I not have the right to live in the family of origin, I'm now being brought in to replace that which died or that which could not come into existence. So over here I was not chosen in the family of origin, the biological family, and in the new family I'm the second choice. I'm not the first choice. The first choice was for biological children. So over there I'm not chosen and over here I am the option. And so when I put it that way, these deeply buried and held feelings can have an enormous impact, an enormous impact. Mm -hmm. Very often adopted children become people pleasers. They simply serve the needs, are here to serve the needs of others, and often do not question when their own needs are ignored. Because after all, if I have a need and if that need is unreasonable, who then will give me away? Will my friends give me away? Will my adoptive parents give me away again? Will my future husband or wife give me away? Mm -hmm. And of course I realize that there are some adopti adopted individuals who are listening to this video saying, I don't have these feelings at all. He doesn't know what, he talk what he's talking about. Well, on that level I would agree. I don't know what I'm talking about. I've never been adopted. Mm -hmm. I have spent time away from my biological family under difficult circumstances as a child, but I've never been adopted. So in that way, I freely admit I don't really absolutely know what I'm talking about, but not every 
healer or someone who works with other people as I do um, has lived every issue that they've worked with and so I speak from the experience of having worked with many many adoptees over many years which means that I have some experience but uh, not from the inside but very close and, and intimate with the topic so it's important that I say that and it's important that I acknowledge that somebody might even be objecting to what I'm saying right now and so it is always important to ask why is the child being adopted? For whose reasons? Is it for the reasons of the biological parents? Is it for the reasons of the adoptive parents? Or is it for the reasons of the child? And so when the adoptive parents adopt, what is the truth there? What is the need that is being fulfilled. Of course there are many individuals who adopt children who already have biological children where there is no issue there of um, fertility or the ability to bring their own biological children into the world and so they add to the family that they've got. It doesn't mean to say that these issues don't exist for everybody knows that even biological children can be brought into the world in order to cement a marriage together in generations gone by, in fact, even last week I heard somebody talk about this have a child, have a child you're having problems with your husband, have a child as if that will save the marriage mm -hmm. and so even biological children can be brought into the world in order to fulfill a function in order to fulfill the dreams of mum, of dad, or of the couple together. And so with adoptive children, with adopted children, this can be especially true. But it is not exclusive to adopted children. It's, it's, it, it happens with all children. So then we move to the biological parents. Does the father even know? Many children are put up for adoption without the consent or the knowledge of the biological father. That I've come across many times. And so often the circumstances of the adoption itself are shrouded in shame. Shame and secrecy. And this also adds a weight a weight to the energy that exists within the family field. It is very important for each of us to realize is that we're not islands and that we are born into a family story that has already been told and is already being told. And so everything that is present within the family system is keenly felt by us from conception onwards. Epigenetics, by the way, is, is um, a new science that is constantly telling us and it's revealing to us in the past few years that the trauma of the father is present within the sperm the trauma of the mothers is present within the eggs and that this has a direct impact pact on the RNA and the DNA and also creates susceptibilities to various illnesses in the children and the grandchildren and so the circumstances of the conception the circumstances of the birth the circumstances of the birth mother's family are very key in terms of the emotional, psychological, mental and spiritual makeup of the individual who then eventually becomes adopted. So what if they have been kept as a secret from the biological father? How then do they belong? So not only are they then given up by the mother to the adopted parents, but actually their biological father doesn't even know of their existence. And this is actually quite common. Then there's the other question of what about the grandparents? What if the biological mother is 15 or 16 years old? Who then gave up the child for adoption? Was it the mother or was it the grandfather and the grandmother? Or was the church involved or an organization involved? So one has to ask the question, when there is a very young mother who is 
unmarried or not in a in a stable committed relationship where are the other adults mm -hmm. it's difficult to put an age on that mm -hmm. it's very difficult to put an age on that to say well all women under a certain age if their parents don't step in to offer to adopt the child then it, the responsibility is carried by their parents um, but I think to simply look at it in terms of legal age, well anyone above the 18, above 18 years old, then it's none of the grandparents' business. I don't believe that that is right either. Mm -hmm. But certainly if we're talking about a 35-year-old woman who puts up a child for adoption, then I would be more inclined to say than the full responsibility sits with her. But there's no hard and fast rules. But definitely I would say, if we're looking at somebody under the age of you know, early twenties, then the question has to be asked, where's mum and dad? Where are the uncles? Where are the aunties? Where are the cousins? Where is the family? Who else is giving up this child? Who else is giving up this child? And what if this child is given up against the grandparents' wishes as well? And so within this whole topic of adoption, it's not just the event of the child being given away, but it's everything that happened beforehand. And so you can imagine how that would be if you are the grandmother who wants to have your child, but is prevented from keeping her grandchild, either by law or by her own child or son, denying her that right, and gives her grandchild up for adoption. That is also an important story that has a weightiness to it. It has an energy to that. Mm -hmm. Just as well if you are the grandmother who says to your daughter, you're unwed, this is your responsibility, get rid of it. Get rid of it. I want nothing to do with this child. I will not support you in this way. Mm -hmm. So both of those stories have a weight to them. And those stories are very common with adoptees, the reason why. And there can be multiple reasons why an adoption has taken place. Shame is always a factor. It is always a big factor. And so for the adopted child, then there is the weight of the shame of the mother and or other members of that child's biological family. So that shame could be around the reasons for the adoption. Perhaps the pregnancy came about as a result of a relationship with someone who's already married, or a relationship with somebody of a different ethnicity or race or religion, or a big age difference. Let's say the mother is 16 and the father is 35, for example. Mm -hmm. um, or simply for religious reasons, that there was premarital sex. And so shame is always a factor in this, always a factor. So there's not only the shame involved in the conception and the pregnancy that is felt by the fetus and the child, but there's also that moment. It's the moment of being given up, that moment of giving up. It is that moment of betrayal, the moment of the handover that can be felt and it becomes imprinted within the cells of the adoptive person that moment of being given up and that can become an eternal cycle that is continually felt that moment of being given up that moment of being said goodbye to forever it is a forever giving by to that being said goodbye to and it is a state of permanent loss that can be there. So that becomes like a cycle of permanent loss. And that also needs to be understood. Therefore what I want to say is that because it's not remembered, and some children were, were adopted at a much later age, three, four, five years old, and so they do remember. But if it happens in infancy, because it's not consciously remembered, it doesn't mean to say that on an emotional level and on a cellular level that you don't remember every single part of it. Mm -hmm. And so 
it behooves us to always ask, what does the child need? Why am I bringing this child into my life? Why am I wanting to adopt? Is it for my reasons or for the child's reasons? And there are many, many things to consider with this topic, and I will cover those in the, in the next two clips. One of them is about the country of origin, if the child comes from a different country or the culture of origin. How do we as adoptive parents, those who have adopted, form a healthy relationship to the biological origins of the child? Actually also to the emotional origins of the child. There's a lot more to, to it than just where the child came from. It's their makeup, their complete makeup. Thank you.